All right, we should be live on Facebook. Um, and like I said, if you uh, want to go to my uh, Facebook page and no. share um, the, uh, the link or the post rather uh, to, to your page so we can get some more options, that would be great. I'm going to make sure that it's public, which I've just changed. So now we should be able to have no problems in sharing the post. Okay. Um, so and I'm on your page and it'll pop up soon or... Yeah, it should it should populate. Um, if you maybe you might want to refresh the Facebook page, and it should it should pop up on there. Because there's like a twenty second delay between what's uh, happening, and while I'm saying that, I should say that the if you if you leave it up um, to see comments or anything, make sure that we uh, mute the Facebook video so that you don't hear it coming yeah. from your your browser as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Well, I can't thank you enough for joining us. This is the uh, has been the the month of focus on the UMKC Conservatory Voice Faculty, my new colleagues. Which, um, while we unfortunately haven't had a chance to really hang out in person, um, I, I very much look forward to the time that we can. And I've certainly enjoyed getting to know everybody um, through our meetings, and and just thought it would be a great way to um, get to know each other better, and also. Um, hopefully act as a recruiting tool so that if there's some prospective students out there that, I don't know, some way or another have found their way over to, uh, to the Under the Hood uh, series that they could get to know us each a little bit better in um, deciding to come to UMKC, right? Absolutely. So we have with us the chair of the vocal studies area, Raymond Feener, and um, it's a pleasure. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, on. it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Talk to me a little bit, Show, share with us your story. How did you get involved initially into music and specifically into singing? Was this something that you came to later in life or something earlier? How, how did that all happen? Yeah, that's, uh, I, I often get asked that question doing like master classes, and I'm sure you and many colleagues have to go through this timeline, which sometimes I have to think way back when, uh, if you went all the, the way. Egg. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For me, you know, singing has been there since very young. My family, my dad, my mom sang in church choir and were musicians. My dad played guitar. My brothers played instruments, trumpet. So I was in high school just loving it all the way through. Choir, thought that's what I wanted to do. Actually, I remember the moment in, in high school. Uh, I come from a family of uh, hardworking, you know, blue collar, workers in factories and i thought well what do i do do i do i follow that as a freshman in high school i was trying to decide where do i where's my trajectory yeah and the one thing that popped in was you know i really love music I've been playing instruments my whole life singing playing trumpet i thought yeah maybe i want to do that so through my career in high school it just became something that was seemed logical and had a passion for music in general and we had a wonderful music program uh, in Ohio, where I grew up. Oh, okay. Uh, Bob, uh, I, I grew up in a small town, Bremen, Ohio, spelled the same, Bremen, right? Uh -huh. But everybody uh -huh. says Bremen. And uh, it's about uh, southeast of Columbus, Ohio, by 40 minutes, maybe. Okay. okay. Uh, in a little town, my graduating class was 125. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's pretty small. The whole yeah. school was 500, the whole high school. Anyway. Wow. Yeah, so so we had a really great, great choral program. Bob Trochia uh, was a great conductor. He did a the Lancaster Corral Professional Choir in Lancaster, Ohio, for years, and used to play trumpet for Bob Hope. I mean, it was really a nice uh, lineage. These great musicians. That's awesome. So I thought, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So I went to Ohio University and uh, as oh, a let's, choral let's, education. Let's back up for one second. You yeah, said you mentioned you played the trumpet. Yeah, yeah. Did you start playing trumpet. Yeah, uh, fifth grade. Uh, oh wow! Okay. Yeah, so my in junior high, were you in band and choir, or just band, or where? Great you? thing about growing up back then, you didn't have to choose, which you do now. My children had to choose band or choir, which maybe you have to go through that now. But um, yeah, I was in band and had in in choir. So my senior year, I was the president of the marching band and president of the choir. <laughs> You know, I was that kid. I did it all. I played jazz band. Oh, wow. Uh, marching band, symphonic band, the elite choir, the musical, the plays. I mean, I, it was just what you did. 
I was in oh, sports, yeah. played baseball, wrestler. Oh, that's a shocker. Uh, that's great. But yeah, I did. I did it all, and I it, it kind of fed me who who I was. It, right. All these angles of different. They played guitar since I was nine, trumpet. You know all that stuff in high school, and I almost became a trumpet major. Actually, that you wow. ask. Well, I'm I glad was, you throw in guitar because that, of course, brings us to one of our first things that we ran at Strong Connection. I was our affinity for Van Halen that's and right. the uh, the talented. I know. recently departed eddie van halen yeah uh, i hesitate to always bring up some of those loves because people <laughs> wait hey, you're, man, if, you're you know. this is what dispels the myth that like opera singers or voice right. teachers or like yeah. some sort of hoity-toity you exactly. know, pretentious people it's like no 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 yeah let's let's get into what we actually many understand. friends of mine who were fellow opera singers and teachers I love finding out that they're a huge Beatles fan or Led Zeppelin fan right. or, you know, doesn't matter the style. And I'm like, yeah. And then you connect and see how it fills in and really tells how their performers, what it kind of um, informs you as a performer, all these different sounds. And I love the blues and I grew up with country and you name it. So, yeah. yeah. I did a lot of that. I, I don't know if I ever told you this, but the reason I became a singer in the first place was because I wanted to be a country and western singer. That's awesome. I was obsessed with like Garth Brooks, and yeah, Black and George Strait, all those right. guys. Right. Yeah, who so, doesn't want to grow up to be a rock star first? You know, yeah, right? Or stars. Like, yeah, and then you're like, well, no, I'm not going to do. Well, actually, I just mentioned Bob Trochia, yeah, who was who was kind of famous where we are for for being a wonderful musician, choral director, or uh, you know all that. And I remember the day, my senior year in high school where I told him, I said, I think I'm going to go to California to GIT, Guitar Institute of Technology. I want to, okay. I want to be a guitar player. I, I love it. And he sat me down in his office. He goes, yeah, um, that's wonderful. But, um, and I support that. But he said, he, he said, why don't you go to college for four, get a degree, get a solid four-year degree, keep right. playing, keep taking lessons. But then after you finish that degree and you still want to go do that, you go, right? Just get an education. That was his big thing. Right, I'm like, right. well, you know, that's mature. <laughs> that's, you know, if I go to California, who knows? I may, may not make it out alive I, I, sure, back sure. in the 80s, you know? Right, right. So I, I went to college and so I went to OU, studied education, music education. This is Ohio University. Ohio University. It was 45 minutes south of where I grew up. Yeah. Um, really fine basic liberal arts school you know it's your typical college town beautiful beautiful town oh bricks brick roads gorgeous wow now at this point in time um hmm. two two questions had you had uh private voice lessons Great as question. part of your choral education in high school at this point <clears throat> and then once you decided to go to ohio state to get your degree nah not ohio you, state oh i'm sorry i'm sorry Ohio <laughs> University. Bobcats. My apologies. My apologies. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know how no, it's not a big deal. the tongue so that's no, all right. <laughs> falsely. Ohio University. Thank you for correcting me. No, um, no, you're good. Did, did you decide that you wanted to? You said you almost majored in trumpet, but did yeah. you, you decide to major? Well, in it was kind of 50 50 at the time when I was a senior. I, I, I like I said, I, I, I thought I was pretty good. I was okay. And it was going to be education. I wasn't going to be a trumpet performer because. I wasn't delusional. I knew I knew what my skills were. I was good, but I, I knew the level you had to be. But I thought I love playing trumpet too. Mm -hmm. And so it was literally every day, this, that, back and forth. But I loved singing, wrote songs, all that stuff. You singing in choir, sang in musicals, never saw an opera at that point. Mm -hmm. Never. I knew a uh, uh, TV, this stuff, but I never really went to an opera. Yeah. But I decided that I love the music better. I loved singing. I love being in choir. And I had started taking a few lessons with one of my, the assistant choir director at the time. Uh, her name was Cheryl Durth, Cheryl Ritten now. And it kind of sparked, ooh, this is great. Oh, I could do some of this. This is a little different. I didn't go very far with lessons because it was just enough to audition, you know, like mm -hmm. a year. Like, okay, so I, ready to do I got things ready. Time. How does this work? So I did. And, I got accepted. And so I was this small town, wide eyed, like, how does this work? Nobody in my family ever went to college. Nobody. Wow. Wow. The I'm the youngest of nine, eight, nine cousins or something. My mom and dad never went. They, you know, they're workers. They're hardworking factory workers. 
which right. I love them. They, they work harder than anybody I've ever met. Yeah. And so I decided, I think I want to pursue this. And I went to college to get to be a, you know, an educator. And long story short, I'm trying to truncate for you, but my sophomore year, I studied with Dr. Ira Zook. Okay. Really great tenor, really fun guy. Uh, really, you know, he was at the end of his career. Obviously, he was a, by the time I got to him, but has had a lot of teaching success. And I, and he, he's the one who took this kid out of podunk nowhere, singing with no vibrato, all falsetto, tenor, high stuff in choir, got me to connect to my body breath and and help me figure out what all this was to be a solo singer um he was really fun perfect person for me to start out and by my sophomore year all of a sudden there's this voice that was blooming out of me wow. I, it was a, it was a man's voice you know so well, so you yeah. you were singing tenor and choir up yeah in i was singing high school it was first tenor i got to college it was first second tenor and it was mostly that light high laryngeal make a pretty sound into a you know what you would use for a microphone really soft kind of right, right. i didn't you just sang pretty and right. falsetto a lot of falsetto to get up through the top you didn't know any better i didn't know right right right, right. until he's like no 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 no. there's more to this and, and do he, you remember like what were some of those ingredients yeah. to create that new recipe that yeah. allowed you to to develop that yeah that, New. Yeah. Well, there was a couple things. There was a lot of life things too. I'll get to that in a second. But the yeah. first thing was he just taught me how to breathe. You know, he's like nothing up here. Obviously, we always talk about that. Nice low breaths. Great. Um, he's he had this thing where every time you were singing, he'd walk around the room and he'd he'd do this into your belly. He's like, yeah. oh, breathe. I'm like, whoa, what? So you'd breathe down every time to settle to get the thing to to stay low. Yeah. And he would talk about the larynx a little bit, not to, you know, get, make me confused as an 18 year old kid. Like, what do I got to do? And it did a little bit on a side note. I remember the day sitting in a practice room and my friend who was a tenor, who was older, he was a junior senior, Mike Thompson. And I go, Mike, I goes, every time I do this and I push my larynx down, I was like, oh, like that. He goes, I go, it hurts. And he looks at me and goes, well, stop doing that. <laughs> And I go, yeah, but, doc, but Dr. Zook said it's got to be a low larynx. He's like, look, you're, you're, you're jamming it too far. You, what you think you're doing, it isn't what he wants. And that was the first year or semester. And so he helped me too. He's like, you got to have people like take the vocabulary and go, oh, he really means that. Okay. Right, right. And so with that, talking to my friends, talk, you know, experiencing it, it kind of, so it was that breath was the biggest thing. And, and it was just over time, lots of scales that it would just turn into, he's like full singing. And all of a sudden, by the end of my sophomore year, I, I was shocked of what was coming out. Like, that's not me. Like, it was, it was a, an amazing moment of, of finding my body, which connected to this vocal apparatus and they connected. And then, I, then to see what I could do, which was art song and then arias. And the first aria he gave me was De Viene a la Finestra. And, you know, it's a straightforward thing. You know, I was too young for the role, but it was a, you're just going to touch on this to, to kind of experience this new sound. Sure. And man, I sang that thing every day, every day, every day. I couldn't get enough of that feeling of, I'm an opera singer, opera man, right? It was great. Now, how, how was that transition in your mind from like thinking of yourself as a tenor and he's like, no, 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 you're a baritone. I mean, well, it wasn't that. It wasn't that I was thinking, well, I can't be a baritone or I'm, I used to be that. Uh -huh. It was really just, I'm really now for the first time a singer. Uh huh. You know, before I sang. Right, right. Yeah. Right. People play the piano, but are they a pianist? Right, right. You know, I was, I sang. Sure. I was pretty good at it, I had a good ear, loved, loved to do it. But at that moment, it wasn't like, oh, I'm one or the other. I just finally became, I put the coat on of, I'm now a singer. I got the green coat, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It felt like that. And it just, and then my friend, my late friend, Charlotte Stegman, mm. she was really tall, big soprano. Uh, oh my gosh. 
she's a wonderful singer. She's much older. She had children, and uh, but she had come back to school to cut it so she could teach. Right. Uh, we did Traviata, and she was uh, Violetta, and it was just a beautiful sound. Anyway, she goes, Ray, you need to join opera. And I, I, I at that point, I still didn't join opera because I was an education major, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, really? I mean, oh, oh, I don't know, maybe. So then I sat in on spring quarter opera scenes. It, they were doing the Anvil Chorus. And it, <laughs> I walk in there, and I'm like, this full room of of singers and they were just one piece after another they were doing i'm like it blew me away wow and i was like i want to do this yeah and so yeah so then i was an education major i took five years to do my undergrad because i started to do more singing right and so the first real show obviously was the opera scenes but then i did they did uh, i did like the armored man i think it was or you know those duets in the in magic flute, magic flute yeah. you know, next year junior i'm like and i remember standing on the stage going how did i get here <laughs> literally i was like how, what am i doing this is amazing this is this is real singing you know this is cool stuff that's awesome and the next year i did um I think it was uh, Baron Dufol, and then the next year was Marcello, which was so I go that was like your senior year, senior super senior year, my fifth super year, senior year, fifth year, like boom, boom, boom. I would go from not really what is this thing to you know, but I'm you know, it's like, yeah, it, like it was oh, it was oh. quite the journey, and so I, I felt like I was a singer, I was doing really well, but I was still a, a teacher. And I had to decide, what is that? What am I going to do with that life, this thing that I have and have been doing? And uh, in the summer after my, I graduated, I got a call from a, from a public school, northern Monroeville, Ohio, up north near Toledo. And they said, come up for an interview. We got your information. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll be there. And so drove and got the job, K through 12 teaching. Wow. So that, well, okay. So I tried it. One year, one year, I and I was like, "Nope, I think I want to sing." So I went yeah. back to back, got my master's, uh, started to sing some more, and and started to call to back to Ohio University, Ohio University to study with Dr. Zook, which I did for one year, and by that point, I had studied with him for six years, yeah. and I thought, "No, I I think I need a new perspective." Not that he couldn't teach me more. Oh, sure. But they just hired Marjorie Bennett Stevens, who's now at uh, Tennessee, just retired from Tennessee. Okay. Great teacher, just hired. Her husband was Roger Stevens, a stage director. And I said, I think I just switched to her just to get different vocabulary, different ideas that I could add on. And the first time ever that I switched studios, which was very difficult to do uh, because I loved the man, Dr. Zook. Sure. But yeah, it just continued to grow. Um, and then I was started to sing for um, Opera Columbus, uh, Columbus Light Opera, doing a lot of that, kind of getting my foot in the door, summer times and yeah. springtime shows, um, Roram and uh, GNS and some of the lighter stuff. So I was still fairly young at the time, I, in my mind, because I, I was a singer, but it was that, am I an opera singer? It's like, how do I do that? And right. so What's during my master's, I was trying to figure that identity, you know. Right, right. Well, let's say this during your um, time with Dr. Zook and going into your master's, yeah. um, once you learned to sing on the body and, and you learned how to sort of really connect as a full bodied instrument, yeah. um, what were some of the other technical challenges? Like, were you, a, once you started singing, um, were you the type of singer that, that always had sort of an easy top or did that mm -hmm. take some time to, to come in or Great question? what, what kind of, um, or challenges were you it was about? challenging i think pretty standard once i found my body i mean that unlocked a ton i mean sure. it, he, he was so good at you know really paying attention to the freedom of the tongue and the jaw and always being aware of how much was too much and too little and i played trumpet which was a problem because i would i would take the abdominals and i'd be it would be too tight too tight and also the did you did you find trouble with the pressure in the brain yeah Oh yeah, it was too much. And and so it helped me in one regard because I already knew some semblance of, oh, I gotta do something. I gotta move some air and I gotta engage. But there was a there was a month or two like, careful, you're gonna do too much. So once we found that balance, I I could feel 
the strength in my sound. Um, but the top w was okay. I, I could get up through, you know, not consistently, but I could negotiate the G's fairly well, but then I would lose it. And then I would gain it and I would lose it. And I'm like, what am I doing? And it took me a little bit of time. Like everybody, it's the passaggio. Sure. Yeah. And, but, you know, unlike everybody with a teacher, you either have somebody that can help yeah. you navigate through that or if you're yeah. just kind of shooting in the dark. And so yeah. what were some of the things about your your navigation through the passage yeah. that really helped? Yeah, it's there's a couple things. The one thing for me uh, that that really caught me over the years and started with him was not to listen with my outside ear, because the more I started to listen to my chest voice, the middle, the fullness of the staff, yeah. I wanted that same full sound on the top and I would shout. It would just go open and open and open. And he'd be like, you can't listen with your outside ear. It's an internal sensation, it's internal ear. And, and the vocabulary in my brain over the years turned to understanding that sometimes that sound that you hear is different than the outside sound. Somebody else is gonna hear a clear sound when you're hearing a muffled sound or a smaller sound. Exactly. He would, over the, even Marjorie Stevens would teach me that too. And eventually my teacher, Jerry Pope, it's oh, a yeah. gathering, it's a gathering of, of the vowel, you know, keeping the tongue to the teeth and, and feeling a, a feeling of funneling of that vowel. So it goes through the passaggio. If I opened it up, um, you, you're just shouting and the larynx naturally wants to shout. Right. The shouting range really is where the first passaggio starts. So any place where you, you say, hey, Joe, across the street, when you start to call, that's where that first passaggio kind of starts. So you got to be aware of where you naturally want to yell and you have to feel that it gathers, goes up and over still with your space, your connection. But it's a different sensation that's behind my eyes or my nose, not through it, but there's a smaller sensation of gathering. That's the only way I know how to say it. Oh, I, I, I agree. And it comes with the vowel. That, that, yeah. And then when you're singing it, you're like, is that right? And they're like, it's amazing because when you listen to it, it's not quite what you think it should be. So that that was one of the biggest ways to get through that area. There's I love that you mentioned, or that, and he mentioned to you that um, you, know, you can't listen with your outside ears. Um, I, I was very fortunate with my lineage of teachers. And from the very get go, yeah. my first teacher demanded that we recorded our lessons. This was back with cassette tapes, of course. Right. But right. we record, he had, a, he had a cassette tape recorder and a microphone set up in the studio we were required to um, record our lessons and listen to them. Uh, and he would ask us stuff about like, okay, so from last lesson, talk to me about what you learned when you went back and listened to your lesson right. um, about this and that and the other. And so I've been so uh, fortunate to have that always sort of in my mind of like, yeah, I can't hear what, I shouldn't listen to what it sounds right. like as I'm Never. doing it. Never. And still today, you know, it's like totally. one of the benefits of sort of teaching, um, virtually is that we have zoom and it's so great to be able to record the yeah. lessons via zoom and so that the student yeah. has this copy not only of the audio but the video too absolutely so much of what we're doing it's important 100%. to go back and watch and be like oh yeah. yeah i didn't even realize i was tensing my jaw or i was doing this weird yeah. thing with my elbow or shoulder or what you know totally. it's so great for the students to record their lessons on zoom and you know to have that as like a an additional study guide when we're because you know they're only with us one hour a week yeah, exactly which is sort of a shame so yeah I, I i i really really um appreciate that because and that's exactly what i tell my students I'm yeah. like, don't listen to yourself never what does it feel like what does it feel like and the, and people say that all the time you read it in some textbooks it's and you know that the logical aspect of teaching and singing and performing that Everybody says, don't, don't listen and feel feeling is the, and you're like, yeah, I got it. But until you really experience it, that sensation, and you think there is no way that's right. But your teacher goes, uh, what was that? Cause that's gorgeous. You're like, no right. way that's right. How many tenors have I taught who think their B flat is terrible because they hear, uh, the background noise, the, right. Now, like right. we don't hear that. You have to trust this other, either it's, it's muted, it's like, or it's right. breathy. The high C has a lot of background noise in it, right? Yeah. And I say, just, just go for it, trust it, as long as it's supported. They don't, you don't get it until you listen, like you said, yeah. a video, a recording, or you trust the teacher. It's like that, 
I said, you have to trust the wrongness of it. The yeah. feeling that it might feel wrong when it's actually right. Everything in singing is like an opposite, right? There's two parts of that. It's, it is right, but you think it's wrong in many situations. That's wow. why it's so hard. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you know, we could <clears throat> probably bring in the word chiaroscuro at this yeah. point, right? There's this yeah. balance of opposites, like Absolutely. you say. Always. There's the light and the dark that we're always trying to keep in check with one another. Yes. And sometimes that can be literally the the ping and the warmth or yeah. like what you're talking about it can be the 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 right and the wrong not necessarily wrong though right but what 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 came to my mind was that if you're not used to singing as an opera singer which initially who is right you start to make these sounds that you're like well that couldn't possibly be that, it right weird, and what yeah. are these sounds that we're trying to achieve they're operatic sounds yeah and the other day i was talking to a student and i and i mentioned what if we used the adjective operatic when we were talking about um, a, a, a building that caught on fire. Dude, did you, did you see the building downtown catch on fire? It was operatic. <laughs> that would make the, the person on the other, what? what? What happened? Oh my God. <laughs> you know, it's it's like, is there, an, is there a word that is more right. exaggerated than operatic? Right. And when you take that into context and you're thinking of like, creating operatic resonance or yeah. refining a vowel to include operatic yeah. stretch or whatever it might be that we're talking about. Yeah. When somebody's not used to making those noises, you know, it's like, no. wait, could yeah. that possibly be it? It's like, yeah. 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 I mean, there are times when, when w this happened years ago when I was teaching as a grad student, uh, even with, they were non-music majors. And the first thing I would say to them is I just pretend you're an opera singer. They came from all different majors. It was a non-music major class. Right. And I said, we're just going to have fun. We learned a piece or part of it, you know, and I said, okay, just pre what would it even imagine that would sound like? And therefore what it would feel like in your body. Probably 90% of the time, what happens? They get up there and they sing like this and I'm going to sing. And I'm like, yes, you're halfway there. They're like, really? I was just pretending. Yeah, exactly. There's a little bit of a component of exactly. putting that code on that opera. Like, like you, like I said to you earlier, it's like, I felt like I was a singer. I was becoming this identity. What was that like? Well, you do have to have a little bit of a creative aspect of pretending now I'm going to be an opera singer. And you, and you, the body kind of responds a little bit. If you've had any sense of what that sound could be. Like if you've heard an opera in your life or right. saw it on TV and they're going to make fun of it. They're going, oh, they, they sound like this. Yeah. You just made all the space you need compared to your speaky voice. Right. Right. And they, they go, oh, that's, that's not what I expected. And then you try to get them down the road to stay that way and to sustain the sound. It's one thing to say it. It's one thing to get there and to, through the first try or two, but it's sustaining that feeling right. over you know time. And of course, eventually trying to not allow it to be like mimicking something or True. you know uh, yes, uh, pretending to be something, but yes. really meaning Finding. what you say and saying what you mean to a yes. level where it can become truly uh, the best teaching organic. that i've ever had with azuk uh marjorie bennett stevens and i and gerald pope i got especially from dr azuk because i was so young learning i was an education major he didn't he didn't have to teach me the same way sure. he taught me as a performance major he taught me he didn't care whatever you are coming in we're going to find your potential yeah and and so i appreciated that through him to find in every student their organic, natural, balanced, supported tone. Everybody has a different tone. You can't, you can try to mimic a little bit, like we said, yes, you, it'll get you there so far. Right. You're trying to find that organic uniqueness of each individual. And that's the fun part is, is really sometimes it's adding on. Yeah. Sometimes it's chipping away. Yeah, absolutely. To fu the, like, you know, the whole thing with the, the artwork, it's, uh, it's, in the, it's in the marble. You yeah. just have to shape it and find it. It's already there underneath, right? That's right. That's, that's true. Yeah. Talk a little bit about your experiences um, as a singer with, you know, I mean, I'm, I assume that you were still participating in choral ensembles while you were still learning to 
yeah. find that full yeah. engaged body voice. Totally. How did you balance that going back and forth between? Because and and talk about. Yes. I mean, do you think that there you know are differences between choral singing and solo right. singing, and and yes. how do we how do we sort of find that balance? Yeah, great question. It's a question for the ages, right? Yeah. Um, it will be there forever. Um, First, let me say that I am a huge fan of choir music, choral music. I conduct a uh, church choir because I loved the art of conducting. Yeah. It was in my undergrad. I still have that in my mind. And, and so... Um, and was the gentleman that you mentioned who was the trumpeter for Bob Hope, was the, the one who encouraged you to get your degree, was that your choir director? Or yes. Choir director? Wow, okay. So he did both. He did some band directing and then eventually moved to choir. Uh, so yes, so I've had that influence my whole life. Yeah. And so, you know, anything, I, I always tell people when I'm talking about the differences between operatic singing or solo singing to the choral field or even musical theater or any other style, country music, whatever, sure. you know, everything has its own requirements. That's it. So choral music has its requirements. Musical theater has its vocal stage requirements, opera, and therefore. So we're using technique that's definitely related, right? We're using the same instrument. Sure. But I have to make some adjustments in order to uh, fulfill the requirements in those different categories, yeah. right? Just like a trumpet player, Marsalis used to take six months to prepare for some jazz concerts, and then he takes six months to prepare for his classical concerts, right? So a lot of professional instrumental musicians feel the same way. They have to take time to do, they separate them a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in vocal music, let's start back at the beginning. Yeah, there was a day, I still remember it, at the moment where I just told you that my teacher got me to sing, the sophomore yeah. year, I was in my university singers ensemble satb mm -hmm. and i start and i he moved me to bass uh baritone and i said i got some things going on he was very wonderful to, to move me around which which is nice yeah, right that's really great that's and, you know that could have been i mean can you imagine no yeah. i don't care yeah. what you're doing in your private lessons you're going to stay on tenor you, need, you can sing falsetto you need to stay up there and just can you imagine? yeah he didn't do that and i actually remember the moment after rehearsal and i said uh, his name was uh, Dr. Jargisian. And I said, there's a couple ways I could sing, and I need you to hear them both. I'm, I've discovered something. And right there, rehearsal was over. He goes, well, sing this line for me. And I said, I could sing it like this, which was the lighter, you know, off the voice. And right, then I said, I could breath, sing yeah. it like this. And it was an E, E flat. And so before I used to, it was very light. You would just go up and the larynx would go up. Yeah. But now I went up like this. And he was like, like that. I'm like, <laughs> great. Is that okay? I mean, it's going to be bigger. He goes, don't, yeah. you don't worry about that. Let me worry about that. I'm like, great. So I started to <clears throat> explore how to use that voice within the choral ensemble. Yeah. There were moments where I couldn't sing full out fortissimo blastissimo is what i call it in blastissimo, that's yeah. great i couldn't do that but uh, you know we he my teacher choral director we were all communicating to figure out how to be healthy with it right. so there is a difference uh as long as you're aware of it your teachers are aware of where you are to help you through that i think there are often <laughs> There are often singers and maybe teachers, uh, hopefully not. Um, how do I say this? Uh, they don't know the difference. You know, they, they are in a choir and they're singing pretty and they don't know that maybe the voice they're using isn't either to their full potential maybe, or they're not fully connected. Right. To the sound where it would actually be healthier for them, for the testatura. Because that's what I found the fir at first was the tessitura became much easier and I was less tired at the end of a re choral rehearsal when I was fully supporting. And so once I found that full thing, I could actually pull b forward and back on the dynamic throughout the range. And, and But there's a lot of singers, especially the young ones, they don't know. I didn't know. You just, you just go up and down the scale and the larynx goes up and down and... Sure. And then you go into the studio and they're like, what have you been doing? What do you mean? <laughs> so well, they, I mean, and part of that issue can be that, you know, usually they're doing choir five days a week and they're yeah. doing voice lessons one day yeah. a week. Yeah. And, you know, if they're there, especially if you're a performance major and your goal yeah. is to sort of 
be on a stage of some kind right. and perform. It's yeah. it can be sort of you know, a, a, a challenging uh, juxtaposition, yeah. but that's why, I mean, I'll throw in a little bit of UMKC here. I love that our director of choral activities, Shanae Robinson, she comes from a background of, um, yes, exactly. Uh, comes from a background of being a singer herself. And so yeah, exactly. I love that she supports all of our students singing with their real voice, right? Yeah. And um, that's, that means so much because the worst thing, well, perhaps the worst thing you could do is miscategorize someone, you know, someone who's like a dramatic soprano, have them singing on soprano, right? Word, right? That, right. <laughs> you're just going to destroy yeah. that voice. Totally. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's so, the other thing is, is that of course, choral conducting students are taking lessons, voice lessons, yes. right? which is so important. Yes. Because how are you going to be in front of a group of singers and not really thoroughly understand right. how to sing? You know, I think that, that that can pose problems, like you're saying. When they're asking for different colors, different dynamics, different tones from the choir based on whatever rep they're choosing to do, the big stuff, the straight tone stuff. Uh, yeah. I say straight tone, but you know, it's the lighter stuff. And oh, yeah. when you're asking for that, you need to have singers who understand their voice, understand the versatility that's needed that to do all of that. That's why professional singers, yeah, they often join a professional choir because they're, they know how to use their voice in different ways. A freshman, sophomore, junior, it takes a while. Yeah. Um, so, you got to know as a conductor how how the voice works. Um, I actually love teaching choral directors, the graduate students, um, just showing them how I'm teaching and my students are learning from me and what's possible. And and I, I just they're soaking up all this information. It's quite enjoyable for me to teach them. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Uh, we've got we've got a couple of comments. Dan Daniel Gertis down at Florida, you know, in Florida, yeah. he yeah. says uh, hello to both of you. Hope you guys are great. Ask him about Barber at FSU. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So is this where, by the way, we hadn't quite gotten to where you received your doctorate. Did you go right. to Florida State to do your doctorate? I did go to Florida State. Uh, okay. I went to Florida State uh, primarily for my teacher, Jerry Pope. Uh, yeah. God rest his soul. Uh, he, he taught me how to be not only a better singer, continuing on my journey, but how to be an artist. He really, they all did. But he took it to a level of not putting up with anything less than the the, the top 150 percent of being an artist yeah uh you know obviously dramatically uh, dynamics uh the text it was all about this the text and committing to that for your audience i mean beyond anything i'd ever even considered uh, he really man it just topped it off for me. So that was wonderful to have him uh, later on in my life there in, in my late yeah. 20s, actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I did a lot of roles there. Um, what a great program in the late 90s there. Um, Michael McConnell was our stage director and I studied with Jerry and Doug Fisher, great vocal coach. Uh, Hookman was the other vocal coach there. Uh, great faculty. Right. Uh, so yeah, I did. The second show I did there was Barbara Seville, uh, and it was uh, my first Figaro. It was so <laughs> challenging, uh, obviously. Uh, and I remember the first rehearsal staging the Largo, <laughs> you know, was trying to, he goes, okay, now try this. And, and McConnell was very, very big on spontaneous, you know, creativity. He'd be like, okay, run across here and jump over here and do this. I'm like, great. And I'd go through it and be like, no, 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 no. I wanted to go back and then try this. I'm like, okay. No, 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 no. What if it worked? I'm like, oh my God. So that's when I started to think, I got to mark this. I've got to, you know, I was trying, I was so eager to please. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I figured that out. And um, I had such, Lynn Eustace uh, was, was in my cast, Rosina. She's up at Boston now. And she was so great to work with. And, and Clayton Jolly, the tenor that I sang with. I mean, anyway, it was, it was such a great, great show. And I learned a lot uh, studying at Florida State. Uh, oh, yeah. sure. It was um, Frederica oh, Folstadt, I remember that. The reason I think of Florida State and Barber is the day Frederica Folstadt walked through the door. It was like she was in, she came to a rehearsal. And we're all like, you know, oh, crapping wow. ourselves like, uh, 
hi. <laughs> So gracious, such a wonderful person. She's the sweetest soul. I, I, that's what I remember. I remember being there, like, you're kidding me, right? What did she's she was sitting there, so we all gathered around and asked her questions. She was she was great. That's amazing. We also have Jared Johnson saying making reference to Blastissimo. Blastissimo. Uh, he remembers that. And he says this exchange is gold, solid gold. <laughs> well, I agree with you, Jared. I think I think this yeah. is great. Um, so great to hear from both of them. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh yeah, I, I don't know why they're there. I use think when I'm teaching, obviously, you're spontaneous. And uh, a couple students, when I first started teaching at UMKC, I still have it, they made a poster. And I found it on my, my the door of my office one morning, and it said Fenerisms. <laughs> and my students had made a poster with all the things that I would just come up with like blastissimo or right the famous one is this this wonderful girl she i said i was so pleased with the sound she was making i go i can't believe that sound just came out of your face <laughs> <laughs> and i was like afterwards i'm like that was terrible but they loved it they, they just they put that on there i mean just these silly things and uh blastissimo was you know i always say in regards to that i say the scale of singing is you know one to ten right. ten is blastissimo Right. You never sing a 10. Exactly. Right? Nine, that might be an accident. That was an oops. I probably blasted that. And then eight is your fortissimo, seven to forte, and you sing within a reasonable realm of dynamics. Yeah, no, that's it, brilliant. That, that, so, that's fantastic. That's where that came from. That's uh, Robert Merrill in his book, you know, he used to talk about, you know, never, never sing into the red. You never sing past like right, the red. Because, you know, the conductor will inevitably say, can, can you give me just 10% more here, 5% more here? Yeah. And if you're like full on tilt, you know, it's like, what's the answer? No. No. I'm bleeding from my larynx at this point. Yeah. Didn't you catch my larynx uh, on the last go through? <laughs> can I have it back? Because, wow, I can't give yeah. you any more. Yeah. You always want to stay within the green, the green and the yeah. yellow, maybe. Never into the red, you know? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's so you did your doctorate at yes. uh, Florida State, and was I did. that because um, you had uh, decided to pursue teaching at a university, or was that you, you, you were in? It was a great teaching? question. Um, my, my initial reason was, again, because I learned how to sing, and in my world, I, was, I felt behind a little bit, like, what is this, right? So undergrad, found the voice came back to get my master's, tried to fine tune it, took some languages, tried to catch up, you know, what I missed maybe because I wasn't a performance major as an undergrad. So, okay, how do I do that? And then, so I just said, I got to continue. I got to do something. And so, um, uh, Patricia Pease was teaching at OU when I was getting my master's, uh, and Lincoln Clark was the opera director at Florida state. And I just sat down with her as a student at OU and said, I'm looking at schools and she, she brought up Florida State. And she goes, there's this really killer baritone that just got hired there that you should maybe go talk to. And I'm like, his name was Jerry Pope. And so the first thing was, it's a great program, great opera program. They do a lot of shows. We did three shows a year, two in the season and in one early early summer, uh, we, we, we were able to do that. Usually it was light opera, but two yeah. in the year, one right in June, which was great. So you got a lot of experience being on stage. And so I did. So I went down there and I met with him and, and it clicked. We became best friends. I mean, I, I adore that man. Yeah. Um, I am broken that he is not with us anymore because, uh, I don't know. I just, we just, we just clicked and Dr. Rivera, my wife, Natalia, uh, at the time was on faculty at Florida state. That's where I met her. All right. Okay. And so they were colleagues. And so then I, I met her and then my teacher became more of a colleague friend because we were, you know. Well, um, you come in as your doctorate and you're, you're saying you're a little behind and you took that fifth year. So I'm sure that you were a bit older than, you know. The I was 27 years old. Yeah. Back then I felt behind. <laughs> I oh, don't wow. know. Maybe a little behind, maybe a little, I don't know. I, it was just so new to me. I, you know, think about the time discovering that this was a thing for you, not imagining that you would be an opera singer, to now being 27, being at Florida with this wonderful teacher and singing Figaro and Cosi and Man with a Shoe Sample Kit. We did all these wonderful roles and operas and 
I just fell in love with it. Um, so I, I don't know. So that's that's what was happening. I went down there and just felt like he helped me become a better artist, understanding music and how it fit. And um, yeah, so that that was that before I started teaching. I was I was ready to to answer your question. Mm -hmm. I was not intending to finish my doctorate. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I did. I went there thinking I'm going to study for a couple of years and continue going because I was getting, you know, the Sarasota studio artist gig. I was sure. you know, doing roles there and performing and I did Lake George Opera and, you know, I was things were going Opera Columbus. Columbus and honestly, I yeah. was like, you know, Iowa and I don't know, like Decorah Opera. I was just doing some things. I thought, yeah, this is kind of what I wanted to do. Yeah. And but yet the teaching side, I took all the pedagogy classes in my master's and at my doctorate with Jerry. Mm -hmm. And it was just something that was still there hung over from being an educator that I really loved. I loved pulling things out of success out of students, but also this is weird, but watching their failures. But those failures turning into these beautiful success stories of blooming out of, you know, that's what I love about it, you know, teaching them that it's okay to fail and they're frustrated, but it, after working really hard, that's where I, I just love to stand back and do that. So that became a, well, maybe, ah, no, I don't want, well, maybe I should, I don't want to do that. So it was back and forth. And my teacher, Jerry goes one day, and I don't know, maybe it's, um, an opportunity that universe just said, this is for you. He said, there's this job opening at Ohio University. And I go, I go, yeah, like, my, I'm somewhat familiar with that. Yeah. Really. But the reason sadly was my first teacher had passed away. Oh. Um, and I was very sad. We went to the funeral the year before and, but he had saw, see, saw the opening and I go, yeah, I know. And I really hope they find somebody. I love that program so much. Um, you didn't even catch the drift that he was. No, and but he, you should apply. He, he looked right at me. He goes, um, "Yeah, I know, but this this is perfect for you." I'm like, "What? No, man, no. I I, I'm not sure. I want to do that. I want to keep going." He's like, "Well, you can still sing, sure. but you've you know you seem to love teaching." And I'm like, "He goes, look, if it doesn't, if you don't like it, just stop." go keep singing. You're, you're, you, you can do that. I'm like, well, I guess that's weird to <laughs> just to start a job and say, ah, it's not for me. I guess people do that. But I said, fine. Okay. Maybe I'll apply. So Marjorie Bennett Stevens had been there and I called her up. I go, my teacher thinks he goes, she goes, yeah, yeah. We were thinking of you for this position. So do you think you might apply? I'm like, oh, <laughs> so I did long story short. I, I did. And I got the gig and I was like, I, and I met Natalia and by the time I went to OU, we had we had our first daughter, uh, my 20 year old daughter now. Wow. And I was like, you know, maybe this is security and something that I can do everything I've ever wanted. I could I, a family, a beautiful family. I can perform. I can teach. Uh, Ohio University is closer to my family. You know, it was like maybe this is what the universe needs me to do. You know, it sounds cheesy, but hey, I'm sitting here thinking to myself, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, my right? daughter is only nine at this point, but yeah. I find myself. In but it, same yeah, way. it's a beautiful thing. And, it, and it's really it fills your soul to fulfill all of those little places. Now, yeah. the singing part, you know, I don't do as much. I, I dedicated a lot of time to teaching and becoming a better teacher, because even though I got the gig, I was nervous. I was like, I've got to hunker down here. I think I know some stuff, but the, well, the proof is in the pudding. How much Jerry Pope helped you to understand the art, artistry yeah. side of singing. Yeah. You're singing and you can, you can technically sing fantastic yeah. and be boring as a, you know, stack <laughs> of bricks on stage, but mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. having that additional artistry with yeah. the interpretation of the text and the purposeful mindfulness right of how you go about you know even preparing a role or preparing a song cycle or whatever it is absolutely i find there to be so much similarity in teaching it's like you can teach technically and you can right. be technically sound in the information that you're giving right. and i'll fully admit you know moment of vulnerability here that's a thing that i know that i need to grow in 
is to is to find the artistry in teaching and to be able to, like you say, you know, turn those students' failures into amazing opportunities to bloom success, yeah. maybe in a different direction, right? Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's 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 amazing that you that you found that such early on yeah. and were able to explore. And I didn't expect it. You know, it was I never as in most things in my life, I I never saw that mm -hmm. ending result. Did mm -hmm. I think that I was going to ever go to college ever? No, because my, nobody in my family ever did. That was new. Did I ever think that I would go get a master's degree at that? Oh, okay, I did that. Opera? Okay, that was new. You know what I mean? And so being an opera singer, and then all of a sudden teaching at a, at a co at college, it was always, life was always surprising me with these beautiful moments. Now, I don't believe in luck. I think luck is you being prepared for those moments that come up, Absolutely. right? It's serendipitous, but, but you, boom, I'm prepared for that. I'll take a chance on that. And that's luck, maybe, but... But life just was like, this is something for you. This is something for you yeah. from teaching, singing, meeting my wife, having a family, all these things and, and things that I never, I never wanted a family. I never thought I'd get married. All of those, oh. everything, everything. I, I was like, I never saw it. I would always be working and doing and working for something and being better. I mean, I knew I wanted to sing, you know, eventually, but at first I didn't think I'd ever be, what was that? Right. You know, opera? cool how do i do that i'm not an opera singer but once i did i thought yes so but the teaching thing wasn't really on my radar until it happened so, right until it was till there it is like okay i i'm going to make the best of this um and i actually i got a chance to conduct too i, I conducted the men's chorus there which had a lot to do with when i was a, a student but i got to conduct and so i got to be a singer an opera singer be a teacher and I got to still do conducting of the men's music, which I love with passion, the singing men of Ohio, a shout out to all the brothers there. Wow. This men's chorus that we grew. Um, amazing. So anyway, I'm blessed. That I'm, I'm happy. It's with all unbelievable that. to see. I mean, you know, I don't know if we want to bore the, the folks listening with, with, with this little nugget of mine that just popped in my head, but I played trumpet when I was in junior high. Um, and then I got into choir and I had no idea how to sing. And then I, you know, we, we have so many similarities. So you talk about men's choir. When I was an undergrad, um, I, I split my time at two different schools. I was at Southwestern University for a couple of years. And then my teacher, Gerald Dolter, resigned and took a position at Texas Tech University, where he still is. Mm -hmm. And I transferred to Texas Tech to continue studying with him there. Sure. And when I got there, one of the first things we did as a scholarship concert to raise money for all the local scholarships, we did Carmina Brana. And so mm -hmm. there's all that male chorus, the interna ah. scenes, you know, that, and I was like, when we got to that, si, puerum, puerum, la mora, you know, I was like, wow, we've got such a great men's chorus sound here. Yeah. And I, in my high school had had a men's chorus and a mixed chorus experience. And so mm -hmm. I thought, is there a men's chorus at Tech? Oh, no, there wasn't. Well, what we did do was all the guys, we played intramural sports because it was a huge intramural sports school. Ah, me too. Yeah. Football, basketball, everything. Ah. And we called ourselves the choir boys. That was our, <laughs> that was our team name. <laughs> and so I was like, well, we should, we should make like a men's chorus thing. And this was also at a time when the band had Kappa Kappa Psi. Yeah. There was Find You Alpha Symphonia as yeah. part of our uh, organization, which I joined. Oh, uh, hell, yeah. Women, there was, um, oh, shoot, I can't remember the women, uh, but the band <clears throat> women had their own thing. Choir, I was like, <laughs> choir, choir boys, Chi Beta. We cre I created and founded a fraternity on campus that was a social fraternity, but also a service organization for the Department of Choral Activities. And then we were also a performing men's chorus. And so we had this opportunity to gather and, and, and perform, but also we'd set up for concerts with the risers and we'd tear down things afterwards. We hosted Nats one year, so we did all the stuff for that. And um, our, fir our first party, I think, was um, 
<sighs> trailer park white trash Kai Beta Christmas bash. <laughs> so we had we had a pretty great run there for a while. Um, but yeah, I just I, I as I'm hearing your story unfold, I'm like, my God, there's it's, such some. It's almost uncanny because uh, even though Dr. Zook, we we didn't have a, a men's chorus my sophomore year. So when I started opera that same year, they started a men's glee club, uh -huh. and I was in the first group. And my association with that group from that moment, this is 1989, yeah. till I was back there conducting, was I actually helped build it. Wow. So I was the first president of the Men's Glee Club. We started to, I created the small ensemble of eight voices called Section 8. There you go. Two meaning, right? Two meanings with the, with the title Section 8. We were all crazy. Um, and then when I came back from my master's, I had a long conversation with Dr. Zook about, let's make this something special. And we created the whole thing. We created the different look. I went out and chose blazers, pants. Dude, this, that, is, this is so identical. I did it all, right? I changed the name because it used to be the Men's Glee Club. And back then, the marching band in the 70s used to be called the Marching Men of Ohio. Ah. And they can't say that anymore because it's obviously inclusive and right, sure. uh, it's turned into the Ohio University Marching 110. Go Ohio, right? So I said, well, Dr. Zook, can we just call us the Singing Men of Ohio? And the abbreviation is SMO. And it hooked. And now it's this, you know, from that moment of my master's building it, we, we created an entire uh, document to where the students help run it. So they have a president, vice president, they help, they do a tour, um, all of this. And then when I got hired, I'm like, it just felt like home. That's now I'm standing up in front of them conducting, but I had all of this experience with them. And it's one of the most proudest things I've ever done in my life was to help That's build cool. this glee club. Uh, I, you know, I just adore it. So that's well, amazing. I, I, I wish I wish I could say that Kai Beta lived on. It, it, it unfortunately it lasted for about another three years, and then it kind of dwindled into uh, the leadership that took over. Didn't really, you know. It was. I wish that I could say that it was still well, there, going strong, but well, it, that's it, amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I was in. I'm I'm a member. I'm a Symphonian, and our Phi Mu Alpha Alpha Kappa chapter at the time was twenty five thirty strong yeah so we that that experience too of we would go around and do valentines and oh yeah yeah and tour yeah, all exactly. this fun stuff that the men's music was something very close to my heart so wow yeah that's really that's really really cool <laughs> yeah. to learn michelle adriana says so great to actually hear you <laughs> i don't know michelle you're talking about me or i, I assume i don't I don't, That's my I don't, daughter. You know, does that name ring a bell? Michelle Adriana? Oh, I thought you said uh, Adriana, my daughter. Oh, oh no. A say, say the name. Adriana. Oh, absolutely. She's a friend from high school. Oh, okay. Oh, she's watching. I thought you said Adriana because my name, my daughter's name is Adriana. Oh, uh, oh no. Sorry. Oh, my daughter's watching? Is that it's Michelle? <laughs> just a shout my, out. My Michelle. wife just posted UMKC in the house. <laughs> I think it's great. We we both, I'm, I'm wearing my. Uh, my yeah. Blue. I got a little blue. I wish I had an UMKC, but We're shout right. out to Michelle. She's amazing. Yeah, yeah. We have great now Facebook friends. She's uh She's a great person. Well, I know that uh, obviously we're looking forward to coming back, hopefully in the fall semester of 21, right? This coming next semester, we can all be back in person again. Yeah. Hopefully. Um, hopefully. You know, you mentioned before, like you had that experience with your buddy in the practice room, you know, yeah. being like, well, don't do it if it hurts, do you that. know? Yeah. I, I think that's what a lot of our students are missing, right? Is this yeah. opportunity to hang out in the halls and be like, you know, hey, what are you working on? Oh, yeah, you know, Professor Hurd has me trying to yes. sigh up into my top yes. and I can't. Oh, here, let me. I, 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 yes. I, I can't wait for those types of conversations and, yeah. and you know, opportunities to grow as students, you know, that, that are able to be back together again. So I know that's what I'm significantly missing is also yeah. I can't wait to be sandwiched there in between you and you and Aiden. Yeah. You're right next door to my office, man. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I will say that moment you brought that we talked about my friend sitting next to me, where I went to school there at OU, the whole sixth floor were practice rooms. Yeah, 
there were a hundred practice rooms and the whole floor, there's a hallway down the middle and there was a big area where you could just sit down and relax and talk with your friends and then all the practice rooms. Well, we were there from eight in the morning till one in the morning, you know, the next day sure, sure, sure. practicing and doing whatever you need to do. But that happened all the time. What are you working on? Oh my God, I love that piece. Um, you know, like, hey, I got, I'm, I've just figured out that I remember the moment I first sang my first high on the staff, F, F sharp in the Passaggio. I'm like, oh my God, that was a full voiced F. And I ran out in the hallway and goes, hey, get in here. And I invited them all into the practice room. And I said, I, I think this is right. And I sang whatever I was doing, this full sound. And they were like, it was a family. Everybody was supportive and they would go to things. And that's that's what I miss too. I agree with you. There's a component of of not teaching each other, but it's supporting each supporting other. Supporting one another. Yes. Yeah. I, well, you know, and I, and I really can't think of a better place to do this. I mean, when I first found out about the opening at UMKC, um, you know, I, I obviously didn't know you and I didn't know Dale Morehouse, but... Aiden Soder and I had done a Messiah like right. back in the day together. Yeah, so I knew right. her. Maria Kanyova and I had sung together a few different times around right. the country. And um, and then now to get there and to find, you know, you and I have hit it off so well. And Dale is he's hysterical. I love that guy. Um, Great so it's stories. really been a joy. Like I said, the thing that's missing, the ingredient that's right. missing is like, hey, come over. Let's hang out, you know. Yeah. Uh, so totally. I, I really look forward to that. But, and uh, we and you, you've not experienced this, but many of us, uh, Aiden and I used to do this all the time. We would we would be in a lesson and a student will either have done something that was like, oh, my God, that was amazing. Or hold on a second. I got a question. And I would go down the hall and I would, hey, Aiden, you got two seconds in the middle of lessons. Right. She's yeah. teaching and she would run down and I go, I just need you to hear this for a second. Student would sing. And she's like, I think he's doing this. He's like, yeah, I think da, da, da. And it takes two minutes. Awesome. Or this was so good. I just need somebody else to hear it right now. Right. I was so right. proud of the student and they would go and I, or I would do the same. So there's, there was a, there's a really great, you know, feeling of that family and helping each other. They're my student, but technically they're our students. And I love I, that about. I could not agree more. I mean, yeah. it sounds like we pre-planned this talk or something. I, know. I swear to God, we didn't. No. But, you know, it, it, it's so incredibly important. I remember like it was yesterday, one of my first lessons, like in my fall semester of freshman year, mm. my teacher picks up his landline phone and called his teacher, John Lease, who wow. used to be at um, Dubuque, uh, Iowa at, um, oh, there was a small, I can't remember, maybe it was called Dubuque University or something. Yeah. Uh, but he, he picks up the phone and says, hey, I need you to listen to this, you know, and, and had Weston sing, sing that. Sing, sing that, that again. again. And it was so, I just remember being like, this is like weird. Like, <laughs> but, but I have to say with that additional confirmation of like, wow, he's doing, he's doing exactly the right thing, you know, and it's so important that they have that. And then to work together as a team with, you know, I mean, that's the way I see us, right. Is the you're yeah. right. There are students and we need to be supportive because it, yes, they're studying with individual teachers, right. but it's a program that we're trying to yes. um, make a name I mean, it, there already is a name, obviously, but trying to maintain that sort of status and to increase that status. And I think that's where it really starts to become, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah, I heard, you know, such great things about the voice program at you. Right. Well, what is it that makes up that program? The people who are yes. in it, us, you know, and I think that the more that we can support one another, the better the program becomes. Right. Absolutely. I, I when I listen to uh, obviously all recruit individually thinking I, I think I could help that student you know that's my mindset I think I think everything that I've learned I think I could pass on based on what they've shown me I think I could help them in my studio however I'm also listening you know that student will be perfect for Weston or mm -hmm. Aiden or Dale you know I'm always thinking of recruiting and I think we all do that yeah like oh my god this student would fit you perfectly well, really right. thanks okay let me write that name down right uh, that happens a lot uh, and I appreciate that and I've been that way my whole life I, and even in my interview for UMKC I remember telling them that I'm like I'm yes my job is to increase my studio but I'm also here to help all everyone's uh, you know even if that student in my studio I'm not reaching I might say you know what I 
Aiden, she's really great with this. You might think about taking a lesson with her. Right. There's no ego. I don't care. Okay. I'm here for them to get better. I really, right. that's what it's all about. So I take the ego out of it. And then, then you can achieve anything if you don't care who gets the credit for it. Right. It's like Aiden just, that was amazing. Or Dale, or, you know, I'm all, you, you have to find answers and sometimes you don't have them all. Right. But, but in that moment, I'm like, someone yeah. does, it's kind of, you know, a bit of it's, arrogance, you know, absolutely. I, I think that what you just said there is like no ego. Well, what is the opposite of that? Someone with a huge ego. Mm -hmm. And what do you always come to find out about those insecurity, yeah. lack of skills? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. there's always a reason why there's one instead of the other. And yeah. it, that that's what I've been met with is, is such no ego, just sincerity and, yeah. and clarity which I can't tell you how much I appreciate because if you've experienced the alternative, it, it is not a fun day <laughs> spent at the office. No, no, <laughs> no. no. By I, the way, Matt Brunner says sixth floor. Ray, who was your favorite roommate? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mr. Brunner. All right. Dr. Brunner. All right. Yeah, he's a okay. temple. He's uh, oh, one of my yeah. best friends in Fabi Alpha, Matt Brunner. Uh, roommates all the way through trumpet player. He's uh, such a great conductor, musician. Um, shout out to Matt there. It's great to see him there. That's he, awesome. uh, he's uh, conducts the marching band there at Temple. So, oh, wow. Very yeah, cool. great guy. Well, again, I can't tell you how fun this was and how yeah. much I appreciate you coming on and, and talking well, with us. And Well, thanks for having us. This is yeah. really special to just to take this time to talk about shop, you know, and have fun. Yeah, well, of course. I think, you know, Oftentimes, you know, we, we spend time, you know, like you're saying, you know, in, in practice rooms in school. Yeah. And I, I encourage that so much. I taught one of the first studio classes at UMKC. I was like, listen, I'm not going to assign you guys, you know, you're singing this day, you're singing this day. I was like, everybody has to sing three times a semester. Yeah. But I want to come into the studio class and say, okay, who'd like to sing today? I want everyone's hand yeah. to shoot up. That's you right. can't wait to perform and to share. Yeah with our studio, what it is that yeah. we've been working on and something new that you've decided, you know, and I've been so happily uh, surprised to, to see that that's really taken on. Um, but, you know, man, talk and shop, you know, I think at some point you, you know, you go your separate ways and you're not always around the same sort of circles of people that you feel free to do that with. And so, yeah. you know, during the pandemic, this was sort of this, this brainchild of mine to be like, well, let's create a show because that's not something people do a lot by the way, right. you know, if, you're, if you're in a, in a show with someone, you know, you, you sing through the first reading of the music or whatever, and, and someone might come up to you or you might go up to someone and say, unbelievable. Like, wow, I love what you're doing. You know, mm -hmm. maybe even somebody more, more specific. I love how you get into your top that those G's are just like, wow, dude, amazing. Right. Right. But rarely do you, do you go up to, Hey, could we, can I buy you coffee and talk to you about how you approach the, uh, you know, cause it's like everyone is, there's sort of a, yeah. uh, I don't know if I want to talk about that. Yeah. So I, I thought it would actually be a really cool arena for people to sort of set aside that, you know, sort of, well, I'm, I'm in a rehearsal right now and I've got to try to sing my best right. and instead, you know, sort of open up about um, these things that we don't often, oftentimes get to talk about and, sometimes requires a bit of vulnerability, right? To say, like, yeah, you know, I'm still trying to figure out this or, you know, I'll, I'll say this, you know, uh, I had a voice lesson uh, with my teacher, Stephen King, about two weeks ago. And, and, you know, we were working on trying to find not only the appoggio in the lower torso, but also this sort of like widening here and a little bit of a lean on the throat yeah. so that we find, you know, he, he was like, he, he's, we call him the voice whisperer because I've never heard the guy sing. I don't know what he sounds like, but he, you, he has such a vocabulary and a way with text that, that he was, he said to me, he's like, well, I, you know, I've always loved the way you sing. I think you, you sound great, but I've also always thought that there's a something more there, you know, and, yeah, right. and, and, and okay. it, was, it was kind of um, amazing that after 20, whatever years of vocal study, I can still have light bulb moments where I'm like, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And I think that, you know, with an approach for us always to be willing to learn, to learn yes. from each other, to learn to become Constant. better teachers, to become better singers. Yes. You know, that's what we're, that's what you I'm never doing. stop learning. If you just spend the rest of your life, 
you know, the, the cure for boredom is curiosity. So continuously look for ways to improve. And I mean, just try to be a better golfer. See how difficult that is. You will spend the next 50 years chipping away at that. And I feel singing is the same way that you're constantly trying to be more efficient with the machine, you know, and if you're constantly taking in information, some you'll keep, some you won't, some will fit you, some won't. But if you're, if you're in that mindset from now until eternity, you can't go wrong with that. There's, there's, you're going to help yourself. You're going to help others. Uh, it's a win-win for people to be in that. That type Dude, of you're my brother from another mother. I, last <laughs> night, I made a reference in a, in a lesson that I was teaching to a golf swing. I was saying, you know, if you go up and time. you see somebody step up to a golf ball and they drive that ball 350 yards down the fairway, right? With a very fluid, quick swing. Right. And you've never hit a golf ball before. And you step up, you're like, all right, let me do that. Let me do let that. Let me do that. What are you going to do? You're going to yeah. I'm going to knock the shit out of this ball. <laughs> you know, it's like, It'll go about two feet, right? You know, the best, the best quote I use all the time. This is amazing that you said that about golf. The, the best quote I ever read was you, this is a golf quote. You want effort, you want effortless power, not powerless effort. That's golf. That is singing. That is, that is everything down to being as efficient as you can to get the big, the best result in the end. And I should have it tattooed on my body or painted on my studio wall because I use it all the time. That effortless power, not powerless effort. If they get up there and they try to kill it, they they may get lucky, boom, 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 boom. but it, or they're going to miss. Right. Yeah. Same right. with baseball swings, golf. So I use that analogy to find energy and power. You know, you're trying to be smart about it, but not overdo it or underdo it. There, well, there's the a balance. Thing. It's totally. the same thing with singing, right? Because like, yes, I've never or. You're learning to create an operatic sound, yeah. but you see someone go like, oh, ah! you know, it's like, oh, wow. In order to create that sound, yeah, they I must have to like, you know, like, yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. so it couldn't totally. be further from the truth. Exactly. It requires, like you said, that's brilliant. Effortless power, not, not power. powerful effort. That that powerless like, effort yeah powerless effort right yeah now. it blew me away the first time i read it and there's so many books that i've read I, of course we read the pedagogy books but i'm when i read i try to find books on sports or anything or art or creativity that helps me make a connection to how to make this crazy thing we call singing make more sense because it's abstract because it's inside our body um all of those types of books and, and experiences help, I think, in the long run. Dude, absolutely. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's like, it's not just, I mean, my favorite quote, which I've got to, I, I always, I, I memorized it at one point, And then I don't know, it's been too long. And so I end up having to kind of always remind myself by, by looking it up again. But my favorite quote, um, uh, and we'll, we'll kind of wrap up with this, but um, Tito Capobianco, you know that name? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Tito Capobianco had come to Indiana University where I was doing my grad work there. And he came to direct a show. He was doing Rigoletto with us. And um, he was also teaching our advanced opera skills, whatever that means, mm -hmm. uh, class. And he started the class when his first day to come in and, hello, my name is Tito Capobianco. <laughs> and, he, and he says, what is opera? <laughs> what is opera? And so there's like 10 of us or 11 of us sitting in the room and we're like, <laughs> uh, a play set to music where everything is sung instead of spoken? No. <laughs> okay. Um, action set on stage you know it's like we're trying to yeah. come up with all these different yeah. things and he's like close but no <laughs> an hour and a half class goes by oh my god <laughs> come back on thursday to continue to think yes what well. is we come back on thursday what is opera? <laughs> and finally like i was the smart answer and i'm like maestro capo bianco we don't know <laughs> I don't think we're going to guess <laughs> what it is that you I want only have about. 15 weeks to figure this <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he says, you, come here. 
And I was like, okay. And he takes out this piece of paper and he goes, read this. Just read this. So he says, Opera is a hurricane of passions of which the singing human voice is the epicenter, dragging fiercely all of the arts with it in a sublime and romantic psychosis <laughs> of insatiable sensuality. Wow. And I was like, yeah, I was definitely not going to get that. I was <laughs> definitely not going to get that. <laughs> but 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 to your, wow, to your yeah. point, it's like, yeah, it, it's not just me, 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 me. Right. It's not just that. Uh, it's it's the golf swing. It's the you know the the intense study of a of a of a craft that takes years. Yes. Yet yeah. at the same time, when performed, must be vulnerable and spontaneous. You know, it's 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 incredible. But yeah, um, that's amazing. That's a good that's, quote, right? That's a great quote. That's a good one. You got, you got to use that in your next class. Oh, Just sure. Take sure. the whole day. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, listen, I appreciate you. Yeah, and, buddy. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, thanks again for being here. And um, we will uh, say adieu. All right, and, buddy. Uh, until next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks,